It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bound and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians 3.1. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Here we have the Apostle Paul explaining whether you're justified by the law or justified by faith. And in fact, the Apostle Paul is going to call his own congregation names. And uh, he's going to really attack in chapter 3, spirituality by works. So we have Galatians 3.1. Galatians 3.1 is not really a funny passage. None of Galatians is really funny. It's just Paul attacking, attacking, attacking. But he's got to in order to bring them back to grace. So he's really going to lay into his very own congregation. And I guarantee you he didn't like doing it. It's Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. Dealing with how one is justified. Are you justified by the law or are you justified by faith? Galatians 3.1 Now in the King James Version it says you foolish Galatians you foolish Galatians and that's pretty tough in itself but actually it's one of the toughest Greek words invented and it means this you stupid unreflecting ignorant asinine Galatians you stupid Galatians is how we'll translate it you stupid Galatians. And why does Paul get so tough with them? Because they've fallen away from grace. You stupid Galatians. Now the Galatians are a group of churches. It's not just one church. They're a group of churches located all throughout uh, this area. You stupid Galatians. Who has hypnotized you? Corrected translation. Who has hypnotized you. They've been hypnotized. Now, first of all, when the Apostle Paul came along, they were hypnotized by the message of grace. And they had faith alone in Christ alone. In fact, the Galatians had never even come into contact with the law. They never heard of the Mosaic law. They're Gentiles. They've never heard of Moses. They've never heard of the law. But what they hear of now is grace. So he goes on and says, Who has hypnotized you? That means a large number of people from the Jerusalem church came down and they decided that they would tell everyone that they need to follow the Mosaic law. And they decided to tell them that spirituality is by works and that rather than being filled with the Spirit, you must strive, you must work. You must impress God by what you do, not by what is God... You can't, you see, what they were saying is you can't impress God by what God's given you. You've got to impress God by what you do. And what you do is nowhere near compared to what God gives to you. It's like jumping out of a jet at 35,000 feet and trying to push it. You can't, uh, you can't uh, exemplify what God has given to you. Then it goes on, before your very eyes, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified among you. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified among you. And this does not mean that Galatians saw the crucifixion. It means that they saw it in their mind's eye. And they believed that Jesus Christ died as a substitute for them when the Apostle Paul told them about it kind of like when you go to school and you learn about Europe. You don't know that it really exists, but they tell you about it and they describe it. 
So you believe it through your mind's eye. And you can imagine what Europe looks like today with all the castles and everything else. And so, this is the same way that it was with the Galatians. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was portrayed, and this means like a public sign, like on I-85 when you drive down the street and see a big public sign. Well, it's been portrayed to them, and they know that Jesus Christ is their Savior. Being publicly uh, portrayed is just like the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center, publicly displayed, and crucified among you. Now, once these Galatians were hypnotized by grace, and what's that grace? Faith alone in Christ alone. At one point, the Apostle Paul came to the Galatians and said, You are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And they believed it. Not only did they believe it, but they were nearly hypnotized by the message. They thought Paul was a god. Then they thought he was an angel. Then they finally uh, decided, well, he's just a great apostle, which is what he was. And so they were hypnotized by this message of grace. And they said, yep, that's all we have to do. Faith alone in Christ alone. And they said to themselves, I'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll be saved. But now they're being hypnotized by another doctrine. They're being hypnotized by something called legalism. And that is what occurs in most churches today, legalism. So Paul taught the Galatians that after salvation... You see, he, he, he stayed with them a while. He said, believe in Christ and you'll be saved. And they were saved. Then he stayed with them for a bit and he uh, gave them some basic doctrine. He taught them how to rebound, 1 John 1, 9. He taught them how to be filled with the Spirit. And he taught them that they must live by means of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. But as soon as the Apostle Paul left these people, some false teachers came in right behind the Apostle Paul. And they started teaching false things. And what they were doing was trying to build upon a foundation that Paul had already built. They're trying to build upon a man's, another man's work. If you have the gift of pastor teacher, never build upon a man's another work. You might think to yourself, you might say, I think I have the gift of pastor teacher. If you do, do not build upon another man's work. I don't care if that man's right or wrong. I don't care if that man is teaching what is correct or what is not correct. You do not build upon another man's work, but this is what they did. And that's why there's no such thing as an adult Sunday school pastor, because they always try to build upon someone else's work. Maybe they're wrong. Probably they are. They're probably 100% wrong in how they teach. But you don't build upon it. That's their flock. And it's their flock for a reason. And why is it their flock? Because they like legalism. So they want to follow legalism. And that is just the way it is. And you can't build on their flock. That is incorrect. And you must, if you have the gift of pastor teacher, you've got to have your own flock. So that's why there are no such things as assistant pastors. My pastor had an assistant pastor several different times. And finally, he came to the conclusion from reading scripture, no such thing as assistant pastor. You either have the gift of pastor teacher or you don't. And so he had all these assistant pastors and every one of those assistant pastors caused him trouble, every single one of them. They got into competition, they wanted to split the church, etc. Oftentimes, they almost succeeded, except they would go on their own way and end up falling all apart. They didn't even know what they were doing. So as soon as Paul left, false teachers came in to build upon another man's work. And that's not the way you do it. And so they were doing this, and what they were building upon was legalism. Now, what Paul is going to do in Galatians 3, 2, you would think that Paul now is going to explain to them salvation by grace, but he's already explained salvation by grace and Galatians chapter 2. So now he's going to teach about spirituality. And they are thinking that spirituality in itself now is by works. And he's going to give them the doctrine related to the filling of God the Holy Spirit and this will be our subject for now and into the next hour. The filling of God the Holy Spirit. And this is how Paul is going to come at them. So now let's look at Galatians 3, 2, and this is where he begins his doctrine on the filling of God the Holy Spirit and the indwelling. 
And the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 3.2, I could rest my case on this one point only, what he says. I could rest my case on this one point only. Paul's about to rest his case right now, but he's saying I could do it on this one point only, but he's not. He's going to keep going with more points. I could rest my case on this one point only. Then he goes on in a bit of sarcasm. What I want to learn from you is this. Now, how is that sarcasm? You, you've got to understand, first of all, the Apostle Paul knows more than everyone there. So he looks at him and says, what I want to learn from you is this. You see, they think they know it all right now. They've gone for legalism and they think that, well, you have to follow the Mosaic law. Besides, these very friendly people have come from Jerusalem, a greater church than ours, and they've told us that we need to work. They've told us we need to follow the Mosaic law. And so the Apostle Paul looks them square in the eyeballs and says, what I want to learn from you is this, as if Paul could learn anything from them. But you see, they're in a point of arrogance and they need to be shocked out of it. So he says, what I want to learn from you is this. And what we have here are four questions. From 3-2 uh, following, we have four, question, four questions that will illustrate the principle of grace using God the Holy Spirit. And this is the first question Paul gives to these Galatians, these stupid Galatians. Did you receive the Spirit by means of the work of the law or by believing what you heard? Now, he could have rested his whole case on that point right there. Did you receive the Spirit by means of the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Now, believing what you heard, the Greek phrase here means they believed it at a point of time. At a point of time, they believed in faith alone, in Christ alone. And they said, I'm saved because Jesus Christ went to the cross and died as a substitute for me. But after they had believed that, some people from the legalist area up in Jerusalem came down and said, you know what? You think you're saved by believing in Christ? No, you're not. You've got to add something to it. You've got to circumcise yourself. You've got to follow the law. You've got to do this, that, and the other to be saved. And so they started adding to this. And so Paul gives them a simple question. Did you receive the Spirit by means of the work of the law or by believing what you heard? Now, believing what you heard have three points to it. First of all, you have to have a willingness to listen. Believing what you heard, if you're going to believe what you hear tonight, first of all, you have to have a willingness to listen. If you've been brought here outside of your own will, it's not going to work. If you come here by your own free will and you have a desire to learn these things, it will work. But if you're here just because somebody wants you to be here, it's not going to work. You've got to be willing on your own. So first of all, believing what you heard means you must have a willingness to listen to the gospel. In this case, the gospel. And also it applies to doctrine. If you're willing to learn doctrine, you have to come here on your own volition. Nobody can make you be here. That, that doesn't apply to children. It only applies to adults. I'm sure uh, teenagers do not want to be here, but th they have authority, and at least they'll learn one lesson, authority. And if that's all they learn, then good for them. They've learned authority. But in terms of adults... They have, they can, uh, if they wanted to be home and watch television or play a game, well, that's their volition. And we should all respect their volition. Because if you don't, the only thing that's going to happen is resent. They will resent the Word. And they don't have any willingness to listen to the Word. So they'll resent everything that comes out from this pulpit. So the willingness to listen to the Gospel is number one. Secondly, secondly, you have to have individually... Positive volition, that means you, you hear the word and you believe it. Positive volition means you hear it and you believe it. And you accept what is taught. You don't have to. You can say, no, I don't believe that. That's your, that's your volition. That's your freedom. 
and we're all given freedom. So in believing what you've heard, first of all, there must be willingness to listen. Secondly, you have to have positive volition to accept what is being taught. And thirdly, in the case of the Galatians, they accepted Christ as their personal Savior. And that's what they did. So what's Paul doing in Galatians 3.2? Paul is asking the Galatians a very important question. He's saying to them, or asking them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit through the Mosaic Law? Or when you put your faith in Christ? The answer is simple. There's no way they can answer, I received the Holy Spirit when I followed the Mosaic Law, because they'd already received the Spirit and they knew it. They knew it. They had already learned many of these things. And so Paul brings it right down to them in spirituality and says, Hey, are you now, now that you're following the Mosaic Law, is that what brought God the Holy Spirit into your life? Or was it when you had faith in Christ? Answer, faith in Christ. The obvious answer is faith in Christ. And why is that? Because the Galatians, the people we're studying now, the Galatians had never even heard of the Mosaic Law. The Galatians are Gentiles. They'd never heard of the Law of Moses. They'd never heard of the Ten Commandments. They'd never heard of Codex Number 1, 2, or 3. They've never heard of anything as that. The only thing they've heard from Paul is believe in Christ. And, following up, be filled with the Spirit. Rebound and keep moving. Name your sins to God. Keep moving. Be filled with the Spirit. Be under the power of the Spirit, not under the power of the law. And why not under the power of the law? They didn't even know what the law was. The only time they came to know what the law was was when the legalists came down from Jerusalem. Now, the people in Jerusalem knew exactly what the law was. Well, they didn't really know its purpose, but they followed the law. And as soon as Paul left, Paul only taught grace. Paul taught, believe in Christ and you'll be saved. But then as soon as Paul left the Galatian church to go do something else, somewhere else, some more missionary work, some legalists came down to straighten out Paul's teaching. They came down and said, I will straighten out what Paul has been teaching. Arrogance. They're going to come down and build on another man's foundation. And so what did they do when they came down from Jerusalem? They looked at these Galatians and said, well, you need to be circumcised to be saved. And not only do you need to be circumcised, you need to follow the law. On top of that, you need to stop eating your pork. You need to keep the Sabbath on Saturday. On and on and on it went with a whole bunch of laws that they themselves couldn't even fulfill. They loaded up heavy burdens upon these people that the Jews themselves could not fulfill. But remember... Christ came to lift all of that. He's come, and for him the burden was light, and he's come to make it lighter for us. So they said the Gentiles had to be circumcised to be saved. They had to do this and that to be saved. And we have the same things going on today. The whole concept of grace is staked on this one principle that, that Paul brings out. Galatians 3, 2 again says, I could rest my case on this one point only. Paul says, I could rest my case on this one point only. He could have rested his whole case on this one point, and he's using it as a lawyer would use it. And he's saying, I could rest my case right now. You're guilty, Galatians, and I could rest my case that you're guilty of this right now. So the whole, the whole concept of grace is staked on this principle. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? I'll tell you how they didn't receive it. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit by working for it. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit by keeping the law. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit by raising their hands. You see, I'll bring it down to uh, terminology today. You watch Channel 6 today. What do they call the filling of the Spirit? They say, well, you're filled with the Spirit when you raise your hands and you feel good. No. It has nothing to do with works. So you're not filled with the Spirit by raising your hand. You're not filled with the Spirit by walking an aisle. You're not filled with the Spirit by weeping tears of repentance at an altar. You're not filled with the Spirit by joining a church. You're not filled with the Spirit by being baptized, dunked in water. You're not filled with the Spirit by following the golden rule. How are you filled with the Spirit? 
Well, when you believe in Christ, you receive immediately the indwelling and filling of God the Holy Spirit. Then when you sin, you lose the filling of the Spirit. But when you rebound, 1 John 1, 9, if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we do that, we're filled with the Spirit. And all of which is non-meritorious means we haven't worked one bit for it. It means Christ did all the work on the cross. Christ did all the work on the cross. You think you can work for the filling of the Spirit? That's what Paul's asking them. In this verse, did you receive the Spirit by means of the works of the law? Are you working for the Spirit? Or did you receive the Spirit by believing? They received the Spirit by believing. We receive the Spirit by believing. That is at first in salvation. Period. Over and out. No other way. And Paul's having to straighten these people out. And if Paul were here today, he would, you know what he would be saying in Galatians 3.1? You stupid Americans. You stupid Americans. Who has hypnotized you? And then he would go on to say, before your very eyes, and that is the case for many Americans, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed and crucified among you. And he would say, look, you Americans, you've believed in Christ. Many of you have. Many Americans have. Not all, of course, but uh, we have the majority of uh, believers right here in this country. And if Paul were here today, he would say the same thing to us, you stupid Americans. And now you're trying to be saved by following the law. But we've added a few other goofy things because we don't even know what the law is. And that we say, well, uh, you'll be filled with the Spirit if you raise your hand. You'll be filled with the Spirit if you speak in tongues. You'll be filled with the Spirit if you walk an aisle. You'll be filled with the Spirit if you weep tears of repentance. You'll be fear filled with the Spirit if you join our church. You'll be filled with the Spirit if you get baptized and dunked in water. You'll be filled with the Spirit if you live the golden rule, all of which is addition to Scripture. Not found there. And the Apostle Paul makes it clear in Galatians 3.2. Did you receive the Spirit by means of the work of the law or by believing what you heard? You received it by believing what you heard. Notice what he does not say. Did you receive the Spirit by means of the works of the law or by believing and feeling very nice about what you heard or feeling very good or jumping up and down and having some type of experience? No. You received the Spirit by one simple thing, faith alone in Christ alone. And Paul tells them that. And Paul's tough with them. Might be kind of hard to see right here in the English, but Paul's being tough with them. He's calling his congregation names. And that all comes down to personality. You know what most people say. If you don't have the right personality, you'll never have a, a good church. Or if you don't have the right personality and you, you're not sweet to people, well, who's going to show up? I'll tell you who. Very few positive people. That's it. And that's all we want. A lean, mean, spiritual machine. What else do we need? <laughs> what else do we need? Uh, you know, if you just want to be nice and have everybody come in here, you know, I passed a church today on my way in here, uh, one very close to my home. You know what they had? A big, uh, well, they had the Bible school, of course, and this, this big, blowed-up balloon-type thing for children to bounce on something else and nothing wrong with any of that but the only reason they had it was to pull people in are they learning anything no they're hopping around they're hopping around on a big inflated toy they're not learning anything oh they call it Sunday school but are these children learning anything no what they're learning is do this do that well I tell you what they're learning because I went to Sunday schools like that what they're learning is you be a good little boy and you be a good little girl and you'll go to heaven and that's wrong. You believe in Christ and you'll go to heaven. A lot of good people are in hell right now. And you say, well, that sounds pretty tough. Yes, it is. It is tough. And there's only one way of salvation. There's no other name under heaven given among men by which man can be saved except Jesus Christ. You believe in Christ and you're saved. And what are these churches doing? having little children hop around on inflatable toys. What they need to be learning is simple things like the gospel. They don't need to be hopping around. There's nothing wrong with it. If after they have a message and then, then they go hop around on it, well, have fun. 
and maybe that's what they were doing. I doubt it. I bet they're just hopping around. Uh, but I'm sure they give them some kind of study, but it's not going to be... Uh, the Paul would jump all over them, I'll just tell you that. Paul never did anything like that. Paul did not use his personality to bring in people. You have to know that. I mean, if Paul used his personality, he wouldn't be calling them foolish, stupid, ignoramuses. If Paul wanted a big congregation, and Paul had a big congregation anyway. You see, God provides the hearers. And it doesn't depend on personality. And if it did, Paul would never be able to get up and tell them like it was. He would never be able to get up and say, you stupid Galatians, just as I would not be able to get up and say, you stupid Americans. Why? It offends people. But you need to be, you need to be offended back to grace. It's not about who and what you are. It's about who and what Jesus Christ is. He's the one who saved you. He's the one that deserves all the glory. We don't. So you're not spiritual also because you have an ecstatic experience. And this is what Paul is telling them as well as an offshoot. You're not spiritual because you have an ecstatic emotional experience. You're not spiritual because you observe certain taboos. You're not spiritual because you uh, do what many people say and crucify yourself. How are you spiritual? You're spiritual when you're filled with God the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul is saying to them. He's saying, are you now spiritual that you follow the Mosaic Law? Answer, no. They were spiritual when they believed in Christ and when they rebound afterwards, of course. Now, God the Holy Spirit indwells each of us once we believe in Jesus Christ. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, and that's important. We all have it. Every one of us here, we've all believed in Christ, and we all have the filling or the indwelling of the Spirit. We may not have the filling, but we do have the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And this occurs with everyone at the moment they believe in Christ. And you did not receive the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit because you followed the Mosaic Law. You did not receive the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit because you followed the Ten Commandments. You received it because you believed in Christ. And we will note this. So now let's look at Galatians 3.3. 3. And Paul continues to chew out his very own congregation. And I'm sure a lot of them got scared away. Galatians 3.3. 3. Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish in the King James? But again, it's a tough Greek word that means stupid. Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so stupid? Are you so stupid? Having begun in the sphere of the Spirit... See, the Galatians, when Paul came by, Paul told them, believe in Christ. So they did. And they started in the sphere of the Spirit. And that's a good start. What this means is the Galatians had a good start. They knew how to be filled with the Spirit. What this means is Paul taught them the equivalent of 1 John 1, 9. Paul taught them that if they named their sins that God the Holy Spirit will fill them once again. So they knew how to be filled with the Spirit. They knew how to live in the sphere of the Spirit. So are you so stupid, having begun in the sphere of the Spirit, are you yourselves, now this is personal, and that's why it says you yourselves, are you yourselves now made perfect by means of human effort? Are you made perfect by means of human effort? Paul is taking them back in time and he's reminding them of something. He's saying to the Galatians, Hey, you remember when it was faith alone and Christ alone? Remember, you were filled with the Spirit then and I taught you how to be filled with the Spirit. Now these legalists have come down and they've built on my foundation and they're taking, away, taking you away from grace and now you think you can be made perfect by means of the flesh. You think you can now be made perfect by working for it, by a human effort. Now this is the second question. Remember, there's four of them. We'll go over them again. We had the first question. Now here's the second question proposed by Paul. And what is this second question? It goes as follows. 
Have you become just as powerful as God the Holy Spirit? That's what Paul's asking them. Are you so stupid having begun in the sphere of the Spirit? Are you yourselves now made perfect by means of human effort? Meaning you started with the Spirit, now you've gone to legalism and you're trying to work for perfection in the energy of the flesh. And so what he's saying is, do you now assume that you have the same power in, the, in your flesh as God the Holy Spirit? Are you elevating yourself to the level of God the Holy Spirit is what he's asking them. And the answer is obviously no. You see, Paul used a, a wonderful system of questioning, a Greek system of debate, to where it would trap them every time. And the only answer they could come up with is, no, I'm not as powerful as God the Holy Spirit. And of course they aren't. But they're trying to be. They're trying to be through the energy of the flesh by working. And so they're working for spirituality. But the Bible says those that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you cannot please God. Now, you say to yourself, how do I know if I'm in the Spirit? It's very simple. Name your sins to God. That's why we do it at the beginning of every service. Name your sins to God. When you name your sins to God, you're filled with God the Holy Spirit. And you're given the power of God the Holy Spirit, the sustaining power of God the Holy Spirit. And that's the means of your spiritual life. That's the only way to make yourself perfect, as it were, but it means to make yourself complete, to move to spiritual completion, to go to spiritual adulthood. And you can't do it by human effort. Now, again, in Galatians 3.3, 3, it starts out, Are you so stupid? Now, there's a Greek syntax here, and... What this means is it requires a yes response. So really how it goes is, are you so stupid? The response, yes, we are that stupid. Greek syntax. Something we can't get in the English, but the Apostle Paul is being extraordinarily sarcastic. And if you don't like sarcasm, you would not like the Apostle Paul. And if you end up not liking the Apostle Paul, God help you. That's all I got to say because the Apostle Paul was the greatest of all believers. And the Apostle Paul just got done chewing out Peter. Now he's chewing out his own congregation. The Apostle Paul chewed out more people than anybody on earth, except for our Lord. Our Lord chewed out even more. That's why they sent him to the cross. They got so upset with our Lord from chewing everybody out. You see, people have the wrong idea about what a pastor should be. They say a pastor should be sweet. Why? So that you can run over them. That's why. A pastor should smile all the time. A pastor should do this and that. A pastor can't talk that way and really be a good pastor. A pastor can't do that. And all of these human rules, all of these human works, and all of these human rules are attached to a pastor. You know what Paul did with all that junk that he heard all the time? Threw it out the window. He said, nah, -uh. I'm going to tell you the truth. You're going astray, I'm going to give it to you straight. And he did. That's why I said, are you so stupid? So the Greek syntax requires that they respond, yes, we are that stupid, and boy, were they ever. And actually, this verb is of absolute status. And what Paul was saying is, you're in the absolute status of stupidity. You can't see the sarcasm in the English, but it's there in the Greek. And what Paul is doing is chewing them up one side and down the other and he's telling them, you are stupid. You're in the absolute status of stupidity. You are the stupidest people on the face of the earth. For once you started in grace and now you've gone toward legalism. Once you understood that you were saved by faith alone and Christ alone, but now you think you've got to add something to it. Once you knew that you were spiritual by the simple means of the filling of the Spirit, but now you think the law will make you spiritual. And as a result, you are as dumb as dirt. You are stupid. So application of this. Now, first of all, we have to note that uh, this is the strongest word used in the Greek for stupid. And what it's really referring to is you're stupid because you've departed from the principle of grace. Now, there's an application to this. And the application is this. If you're in doubt as to a, something an individual has done, 
Let's say someone's done something. You're in doubt as to whether they've done it. You have some dirt on somebody, in other words. And you're in doubt as to whether they've done it or not, or maybe you even know it. It doesn't matter. But now you decide to go out and spread this rumor, even if it's true. You decide to spread it around, spread this dirt around. What have you done? You're not functioning under grace. You've become stupid. So by means of application, right now, right now, if you harbor in your mind any resentment, any bitterness toward anyone, right now, think to yourself and don't let me know about it, if you harbor any place of resentment, any place of bitterness toward anyone, you're stupid. Why? You've left the principle of grace. You're not giving people the benefit of the doubt. You have your own preconceived notions. You already know how you think they are, and you're just going to go ahead and apply it to them, and that's stupid. Oh, you might say to yourself, I'm saved by grace and I live by grace, but if you harbor any attitude of resentment, any attitude of bitterness toward anyone for any reason, you're stupid and you don't have grace. Not even close to it. So this is what Paul is telling them. You're stupid, stupid, stupid. And if you resent me for saying stupid, then you're stupid. Why? Resentment, bitterness. I'm just giving you as it is in the scripture. Uh, some of the things aren't fun, and uh, Galatians has turned out for me, it's, it's quite entertaining on some aspects and on some levels, but it's still not fun to have to get tough. It never has been. It would be much nicer if I were in another passage where I could give a, a nice, beautiful testimony. And there will be some passages of scripture that have positive sides to it. And will, it will be encouraging in a different way. This is encouraging on a negative side. There are two different types of encouragement. There's encouragement on the positive side, uplifting. Then there's encouragement on a negative side. You're stupid. Encourages you not to be stupid. And some of these things are no fun, and I guarantee you it wasn't fun for Paul. Paul would have rather the Galatians never go that way. Paul would have rather the Galatians stayed with grace so that when he actually got to a point to write to the Galatians, he could write to them in nice terms. Paul didn't like it. And no communicator who has a brain or any sense likes it, but it's part of the job. Every job has a dirty part to it. And this is the dirty part of the job that must be done because people are stupid, as Paul says. So the greatest enemy to your spiritual life is legalism. The greatest enemy to your spiritual life is legalism. And you say, what is legalism? Legalism is this. You try to work for salvation. People will tell you that. You know what people will say? Oh, you did this? You're not truly saved if you did that. Well, let's break it down into what most people think of. You smoked a joint? You smoked some pot? Oh, you're not really saved because you smoke pot. Not true. If you believed in Christ, if you smoke uh, 20 million joints, you're still saved. Now, don't go out and do it and say, well, I'm going to do it because I'm saved anyway. That's insanity. Don't do that. Uh, but the principle is you're saved. Jesus Christ died on the cross for that sin of smoking pot, and it is a sin. Uh, because it's called... Um, it's called in the Greek, it's a, a, a Greek term. I'll come up with it in a moment. I remember it. But uh, pharmakeia, that's right. Pharmakeia in the Greek. It's referring to drug abuse. But then you can have alcohol abuse and get drunk. That's a sin too. They're both sins. And if you do it, you're, you have sinned. And people will say, you can't get drunk and be saved. Yes, you can. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and do it, and I'm not telling you it's an excuse to do these things, because whom the Lord loves, He punishes and skins alive with a whip every son whom He receives. When you believe in Christ, you become a son of God. And as a result, you get involved in any type of sin, and I'm using the overt sins right now. You get involved in gossip, maligning, and judging, you'll be, you'll be judged three times over. Triple compound discipline. You gossip about somebody? Triple compound discipline. Where do I get that? Matthew chapter 7. It's in the Bible. 
and if you uh, for so it's not an excuse to sin just because you're saved and now you're saved you could say goodbye god you could say i'm saved now so goodbye i'll see you in eternity and you will see him in eternity but you're you're wasting your life in a lifestyle of being out of fellowship and you're not under the power of the spirit so legalism is the worst thing that could happen to a believer legalism Legalism doesn't even think logically, as we've been noting from Paul. Paul is attacking legalism on a logical level. And that's what makes legalism so stupid. It's not logical. It just doesn't make sense. What makes sense? Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you. He died on the cross for every one of your sins as a substitute. So if he died for every one of your sins and you go out and sin after you've believed in Christ and you say, well, I've lost my salvation because I've done thus and so, that's not logical. Christ died for it. Does he have to go die for it again just because you committed it? No. He died for it once and for all. It's taken care of. You believe in Christ, it's taken care of. Now, that's not an excuse to sin, of course. And when you sin, you must name that sin to God and be filled with the Spirit. So the greatest enemy to your spiritual life is legalism. It cannot think logically. Now, the Galatians started out knowing they were saved by grace. Now they've suddenly latched on to something that has no logic to it whatsoever. And Paul has always taught them logically. Now they're latching on to something that has no logic. As a result, Galatians 3, 4. Galatians 3, 4. <coughs> Paul asked them a question. Have you suffered so many things for nothing? If so, indeed, for nothing. Have you suffered so many things for nothing? Now, what is this referring to? When you're filled with God, the Holy Spirit, you've named your sins to God, you're living your spiritual life. When you're living your spiritual life, you're going to come under testing. And it's going to hurt. When you live your spiritual life, controlled with the Spirit, you're going to go under testing. Now, if suddenly you go in for the Mosaic Law and forget about the filling of the Spirit... Have you now suffered those things in vain? Answer, yes, you have. You've suffered them in vain. You've, you've gone under testing. You've been filled with the Spirit. The sustaining power of God, the Holy Spirit, has sustained you through the test. You've passed that test. And what is Paul saying? Have you suffered so many things for nothing? They have been, what this means is the Galatians have been growing in grace and in knowledge. They may be at the point where you are right now. And yet... They went for legalism. It would be as if I left this pulpit and then you decided to go back to your Baptist church. Guess what would happen back at your Baptist church? Go back to plus this, plus that. Legalism. <laughs> Even if you didn't agree with it, you'd start to follow it, just like Peter did. Peter didn't believe it. He didn't agree with it, but he started following it. And eventually he would have forgotten the doctrine, eventually over time. Same thing would happen. And you would end up going through the testings that you've probably been going through, going through the uh, family pressures that you've been going through because now you've gotten serious with the Word, so now there's more family pressures, and now there's more pressures from everywhere else, and you're going through testing you've never really gone through before, and you're, you're, you're finally passing these things with flying colors. If you go back to legalism, you went through all of those things in vain. And that's what the Galatians did. They got up to the point where they, were, they had gone far enough to get tested. They had gone far enough to be tested under their spiritual life. And now they've just went right back to legalism. That means they're going to have to go through those tests all over again. All over again. Why? They went backwards. The principle is you either go forward in your spiritual life or you go backwards. You don't stand in the same place. You either grow in grace and in knowledge or you don't. You either go forward or backwards. There is no staying in one place. So what he's telling them is, hey, you've suffered under these testings, and it's been for nothing because now you know nothing. 
So what he's asking them is this. Go back over all the time that you suffered since you've been saved. Remember back when you were controlled by the Spirit, did you endure these trials and testings and heartaches and frustrations? And while you have these frustrations and heartaches, did you deal with it with inner peace and the power of the Spirit? Their answer would have been, yes, I did. I remember back to that. Then he's going to say, now look at yourself under the law. The law has no power to help you through those bad situations. So were your sufferings when you were controlled by the Spirit in vain is Paul's question and the answer is yes. And the reason you cannot have peace under the Mosaic Law. If you decide you want to follow the Mosaic Law, there's no legalism that will sustain you in a time of pressure. And I know it because I know legalists. And once they get under a time of pressure, oh, they seem so holy before the pressure. But when the pressure hits... Why, God, did you let this happen to me, is what they'll ask. Now, anyone who has to ask that question has no power. No power of the Spirit. And people in legalism will ask that question every time a problem arises. And the question is blasphemous, and it's this. Why, God, did you let this happen to me? Now, if you're filled with the Spirit, you know why. Testing. And so you'll grow up spiritually, put some muscle on your, on your bones. That's why. And you'll understand that if you're filled with the Spirit. But if you're not filled with the Spirit and you've been functioning under legalism, every problem that creeps into your life you cannot handle. And why? The law is a curse. The law is a curse. The law is what brings us to a knowledge that we're sinners. That's why. So have you suffered so many things for nothing? Indeed, they have. So Paul is actually appealing the Galatians concerning their past experience under the filling of the Spirit. And he's saying, remember when I taught you, and remember when I taught you the faith rest drill, and I taught you how to be filled with the Spirit, and I taught you rebound. Remember how you started handling your problems, and remember how much better it was handling your problems under the filling of the Spirit than it is trying to handle your problems in the energy of the flesh. That's what Paul's asking them. Because a lot of them have fallen under punishment. They can't handle what's happening to them. So Paul hits them and says, You can't even handle the problems you have now because you're using the Mosaic Law and that's not going to work. And remember back. Remember those memories of when you had doctrine. And now you don't. Many people end up that way. That's why they hop into church and then out of church and then into church and then doesn't happen so much here but I know it happens in other congregations that are larger they'll get somebody who says yeah rah rah I'm hot for doctrine I want to learn the word of God and they get filled with the spirit and they start passing some tests then they uh, reach a time of prosperity they get a prosperity test and instead of saying I still need doctrine and prosperity they say bye bye doctrine I'm having fun for now and they go on a vacation from doctrine and then suddenly they have a fragrance of memories while they're in suffering and say I remember back when I had some doctrine I remember back when I knew uh, some of the faith rest drill and I remember my life was much better so now what back to glass they go until they hit another point of prosperity then back out they go and that's unstable. That's not the way to approach it, but that's the way many people approach it, and that's the way the Galatians approached it. They got a little prosperity, and they went straight in for legalism, and boom, Paul hits them hard. And he says to them, all the law can do for you is curse you. So the principle here is this. What, what did the Galatians do? Well, they had a, a 2006 Mustang. They had a 2006 Mustang uh, convertible. And they had driven to their destination in this brand new car. That's grace. And then once they got there, on their way back from their destination, they said, yeah, I'm going to switch cars. Now I'm going to get this old rickety uh, CM2004 cement truck. Or it was a CT. CT2004 cement truck, old rickety thing. So they hop into this thing, and it barely even runs. Now that's what you do when you hop from grace and go to legalism. 
Why change horses in midstream is what they ask. If you got a good horse and it's going, why even bother trying to change horses in midstream? If you got a good car, why try changing it all of a sudden to get to your destination? That's exactly what the Galatians did. They had a fine car called grace. They exchange it for legalism that doesn't even run. And they just sit in it and push the gas as hard as they can, but it doesn't go anywhere. Oh, it might make a lot of noise. <laughs> That's what legalists do. They make a lot of noise, but they don't go anywhere. They're in park and they can't get into drive. Why? Energy of the flesh. Pushing that gas pedal. Rum, rum, rum. Doesn't work. Got to be in drive. What gives you drive? The filling of the Spirit. Then you can move forward. And that's the tragedy of Christianity today. Nobody knows how to be filled with the Spirit. Nobody knows that it is, it is as simple as naming your sins to God after salvation. It's as simple as naming your sins to God to be filled with the Spirit. It's that simple. And you say it sounds too simple. It's that simple because Christ made it simple. It wasn't simple for Him. He died on the cross as a substitute for us and He made it simple for us so that we don't have to work so hard for it. Yet what, the, what did the Galatians do? They decided, I'm going to work for it. I'm going to work for salvation. That's what they decided in Galatians 2, remember? They said, I'm going to work for salvation. Then in Galatians 3, they said, well, I'm going to work for my spirituality. And guess what Paul told them? You're stupid! So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.